Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to this uh, uh, Education Society Student Leadership uh, and our decision. We are happy that you are all here. My name is Amadou Salia Hassan. I'm the Vice President of uh, IEEE Education Society Educational Activities for Educational Activities. And uh, I'm also the past chair of IEEE Education Society Standard Committee from 2010 to 2022. So I'm happy uh, that this session organized by Education Society, uh, Educational Activities, and IEEE uh, uh, Standard Committee uh, uh, that you are you are you are here for for this uh, this event that is very important for us. Uh, this uh, session is made uh, is is uh, for Education Society Student Leadership and Awardee. Uh, and uh, we are contributing to the Education Week of uh, 2023. Uh, the, so the scope of the session is uh, organized by Education Society, and uh, we will get like uh, all the uh, awardees uh, that uh, uh, of uh, this year and last year. Uh, participating in our society's activities to showcase and also uh, 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 let us know their concern and also their expertise to contribute to our standard uh, development and also uh, participating to our virtual graduate study consortium. I'll let you know later on. Uh, what is uh, Virtual Graduate Studies consor Consortium? To the other participants in this session, it is an opportunity for us to encourage emulation among students and networking with faculty members and industries. As you know, industries also are part participating to our initiatives. The organizers of this session is IEEE Education Society, as I said, uh, you can uh, uh, get the link to the uh, uh, first IEEE 2022 Student Leadership Award. Each year, IEEE Education Society is given one Student Leadership Award. So one of the presenter is this awardee of uh, the awardee of this year. And we have also among the presenters Student Challenge winners of the IEEE P2834 standard on secure and trusted learning systems. The link of the website will show you uh, uh, all the presenters and also the, the, the awardees achievements. And also student best presentation award. Uh, on December 14th, we education society Standard Committee organized a, a, a kickoff of the consortium, uh, that virtual graduate study consortium. And the presenters uh, were did great job. And uh, we had four awardees that are also going to present their, uh, uh, their presentation and share with ITB in the framework of IEEE Education Week. What is IEEE Education Society Virtual Graduate Study Consortium? Our virtual graduate study consortiums will not be limited in time and space only at a given conference. So we are hoping that it will be a sustainable virtual organization initiated and sponsored by IEEE Education Society, approved in 2022, and uh, but initiated and presented in 2021. And we are expecting to team up with IEEE Education Activity Board and other societies, as well as educational institutions 
industrial partners, and international organizations. We believe that the volunteer approach of the participatory action research method that we adopted uh, during the time that we were developing the first standard of IEEE Education Society on online laboratories uh, is a more suitable approach. Uh, so we are expecting through uh, this initiative approved by IEEE Education Society and supported by, it, by our society uh, will help us to make some mentoring and tutoring of uh, our students. We teachers and researchers are ready to help mentor, co-author, and uh, 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 enable students to achieve their academic goals through their participation in our activities. We are also working with other societies uh, of IEEE and uh, other organization units. And uh, the way, this way we will co-construct and use the environment and tools required to achieve the objective useful for candidates. We are very grateful that we have some industries participating with us. That is a case, for example, of liquid instrument that uh, after the kickoff of uh, our uh, first uh, uh, virtual graduate study consortium uh, meeting in December uh, gave us some uh, instruments that we will help students to achieve their academic research. So uh, not going too, too long, uh, the presentation will be uh, some of the presentation will be uh, videos, others will be uh, live presentations. Uh, all the presenter will uh, uh, are not able to come to this uh, meeting today, but we'll uh, share all the presentation uh, after this uh, this event. Thank you very much. So I'm giving the floor to uh, to uh, uh, the. Uh, chair of IEEE Education Society uh, uh, Standard Committee to uh, to uh, to present uh, 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 what uh, uh, the standard also is uh, is uh, is doing in this uh, event. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hamadou. Uh, welcome everybody to this event in the. Um, IEEE Educational Week to 2023. Uh, we are pleased to be here and have the opportunity to share with uh, researchers, faculty members, and students. Uh, I want to say thank you to the organization of IEEE to help putting together this event, especially uh, Margaret uh, Rib and, uh, and Dr. Hamadou's team for uh, making possible this, this event. So I typically, uh, I'm Luis Felipe Zapata Rivera, the, the chair of the uh, IEEE Education Society Standards Committee, and also participant of the working group of the standards, uh, of the standard uh, 2830, P2834, the working group, and uh, we are following closely the development of these activities with students in order to uh, promote the development of the VGSC or the Virtual Graduate, Graduate Studies Consortium in order to uh, have your contributions as part of these uh, standards under development. And also uh, the future cycle of uh, standardization of the standard uh, IEEE 1876. So we're going to uh, uh, be um, facilitating this networking and activities that involve the participation of students around the world, as well as uh, faculty members and researchers. Um, as uh, Dr. Hamadou was was. Uh, saying uh, we're going to share with you all the materials and we're glad to have you here connected from different locations in the world 
this asynchronous and synchronous event that technology facilitates. So thank you so much, Dr. Hamadou. And uh, if there is a, any other, uh, there is no any other thing to, to say right now, we can proceed with uh, student presentations and with the agenda of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Luis Felipe. So maybe you can take the floor uh, of the presentation of the first uh, presenter, the video link. Okay, so we're going to start the agenda with uh, the presentation of uh, Hari Prasad, uh, that is the Federated Online Synchronous Facial Recognition and Authentication, uh, FOSFRA. This is a pre-recorded uh, presentation that uh, is going to go first in the agenda. So, uh, Dr. Hamadou, if you have uh, the, I, I can, I can uh, share it. So, let me just. Try. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. And Hari Prasad, I'm here to present on the topic Federated Online Synchronous Facial Recognition and Authentication System. It is also known as POSTRA. This project is part of the Students' Event for Secure and Trusted Learning Systems 2022, held at the Polytechnic University of Valencia. Spain. Let me give you an insight into the statistics of e-learning. Fifty percent of the learners shifted to e-learning in 2021. Nearly 40 percent of the college students say that e-learning is more efficient compared to traditional learning. And a global $33 billion decline has been seen in asynchronous learning systems by 2021. All these point to the fact that e-learners or learners in general prefer online synchronous e-learning solutions over other types. The problem with current solutions or systems is its username and password-based authentication. These systems might also incorporate two-factor authentication with the help of SMS, email, or trusted devices, but still the problem arises in the fact that the username or password can get into the hands of a person who is not authorized to use these systems. Let me introduce the post, which stands for Federated Online Synchronous Facial Recognition and Authentication System. It's a solution based on computer vision and deep convolutional neural networks. There are three aspects to FOSRA. First, the authentication system. Second, the privacy of the data that is being used for the authentication. And then focus or attention analysis during the synchronous online session. So what does FOSRA do? Well, FOSRA performs authentication by a CNN-based facial recognition algorithm. It also ensures privacy of the data by means of a federated learning scheme it also dynamically updates the model by means of an online learning process. It also analyzes the focus and attention of e-learners over a synchronous learning session. ...image of each individual. Uh, the encoder part would output an 8x8 eight eight feature map, which is then compared with the reference feature maps that were generated during the training process using an SSIM-based comparison in order to perform the facial authentication. 
another aspect of post plus system is the focus analysis so focus analysis will give us an insight into the attention and the focus of an online learner during an online synchronous learning session by means of a graphical out so here you can see that uh, during the session when there is a shift from for shift in focus uh, you can see there is a dip in the attention or the focus graph and uh, this indicates that the person has uh, shifted their focus or attention from the online session so this entire system works with the help of eye detection which is then used for gaze estimation and the horizontal gaze and vertical gaze along with the blink rate uh, is combined together to estimate the attention or the focus of a person during an online session another aspect of post plus system is its federated learning scheme that ensures data privacy so the post plus system ensures that the data that is used for online uh, session authentication doesn't leave the local device so let it be a mobile device or a laptop that is used by the e-learner to access an online learning session their data which is the facial information that is being captured using a webcam doesn't leave the local device rather uh, the a copy of the model that is stored in the cloud server is taken from the cloud server into the local device and and, and the authentication is performed within the local device further the data that has been captured from the local device is used to train the model locally within the local device and then once the training is complete the model is then copied to the central server so with this entire system uh, an online learning scheme is also employed uh, with the fact that the data doesn't leave the local model and hence total privacy is ensured so to summarize how the entire post plus system works uh, the data that is basically captured using a webcam uh, which is the facial images is sampled and uh, a cnn based face detection and cropping alg algorithm is used to crop the facial features or the facial uh, region and this data is then fed into the local model which is an auto encoder based cnn model uh, to perform inference and online learning simultaneously and once the model is trained or the inference is complete uh, a parameter transfer or copy of the model from the local device to the central cloud server uh, takes place um, completing the federated learning scheme and the facial features that is being extracted using the local model is then compared with the local feature map that is already available within the local device and an ssim based comparison of the encoded feature map and the reference map is performed here to perform the authentication and uh, in parallel uh, once the authentication uh, happens and the person is you know able to access the online learning session as the online session continues uh, the live data from the webcam is fed into and gaze estimation and uh, blink detection algorithm which further estimates the focus or the attention of the individual and results a focus graph which can be later used by the organizer or the teacher that organizes the session to ensure or to or to estimate the focus of uh, the students during that particular session so why force is better well force is superior to traditional learning system in terms of privacy of the user data since it uses a federated online learning scheme but the data itself doesn't leave the local device it's also a robust authentication algorithm compared to a username or a password based authentication system since it uses facial recognition it also incorporates continuous learning scheme so that the model accommodates to the various changes in the environment of the individual that uses the online learning session it also it also performs focus and attention analysis to give additional information about the online learning session to the organizers so that uh, they can do various other analysis on the entire learning session the impact that force plus system brings into um, the the entire domain is that 
the algorithm or the system itself is a dynamic and a lightweight solution compared to existing solutions. Uh, it's a very simple approach, but it's much superior compared to the existing systems that uses a simple username or password based authentication or uh, systems that also use facial recognition system, uh, facial recognition solutions, but still the data, uh, you know, data privacy is compromised. So this is the entire roadmap of the project and uh, currently the project uh, is in the stage of uh, working on a federated learning scheme and fine tuning the model so that it gets better uh, in recognizing traces and different uh, lighting conditions or different scenarios. Finally, uh, the post application and integration with existing systems uh, is comparatively easy since it's available as an API and uh, it can be integrated to existing solutions such as Zoom or Google Meet uh, with the help of the API. Also, this ensures that it provides a more secure and privacy enhanced authentication system to existing solutions. So if you're interested in accessing the project files and uh, trying it out, Postgre is available in the following GitHub link and it is uh, entirely made using Python, DLib, OpenCV, and TensorFlow. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, uh, this presentation. The author is not here. Uh, please also uh, take a note and then later on uh, we can uh, initiate some discussion offline uh about this presentation that will be also shared so what we are expecting is a continuous sustainable uh discussion discussions uh through the presentations at the end of the session also we can discuss about all the presentation even if the pre presenters are not uh, in okay thank you dr hamadou so uh, our next presentation um, it's uh, from uh, Dubé, Prince, and Bassa Okile. It's the title Web Class Attention and Authentication System WCAAAS. Uh, so if the author is present, we can uh, provide a way to share the screen for your slides. It's uh, Dubé present. So we're going to uh, continue with the next one and we'll leave this for the end if the author comes uh, to the session later. So we're going to um, proceed with uh, Xavier Midhun Parvati Soba. It's Xavier connected. So we're going to uh, go to the next one. Um, and Xavier, we can present the video. So we're going to 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 watch the off uh, asynchronous video sent by Xavier. And uh, if Dubé comes, we're going to switch that presentation the order. So let's proceed with the video of Xavier Midhun Parvati. Uh, Soba. So, uh, it, uh, as I said, the presentation is a decentralized application for security data handling using Ethereum smart contracts, DAPP. So, let's uh, proceed with this one.
Hello everyone. Today, we are excited to present to you a revolutionary concept that has the potential to change the way we think about Let's learning management that. systems, LMS, in educational institutions. Our team has developed a decentralized learning management system called the LMS that aims to address the drawbacks of existing LMS and provide a more secure, transparent, and decentralized platform for managing and delivering education content. So, without further ado, let's dive into the details of the LMS and explore how it can transform the way we manage and deliver educational content. Let's take a closer look at the drawbacks of traditional LMS. One of the biggest issues with traditional LMS is that they store data on centralized servers. This makes the system insecure, unsustainable, and vulnerable. Hackers can gain access to the centralized server, change the content of the website, or potentially access sensitive information such as students' personal information and grades. This puts both students and educators at risk. On the other hand, the traditional LMS is that they have a single point of failure. If the central database or server collapses, the entire system goes down, making the system vulnerable. Another major problem that confronts traditional LMS is their sustainability. With the content addressing feature of IPFS, we eliminate the need for constant requests to centralized servers for file location, resulting in faster file transfer and reduced energy consumption. Decentralized systems, like our decentralized LMS, offer a more secure, transparent, and sustainable platform for managing and delivering educational content. Let's explore how decentralized LMS can revolutionize the way we think about LMS and provide a better learning experience for everyone involved. This figure illustrates how we've integrated blockchain technology and IPFS protocol into our proposed architecture. Let me walk you through the steps involved in using this framework. Now, let's look at how IPFS works. The IPFS protocol uses content addressing to identify each file in the system uniquely. This means that rather than asking where to find, a particular file, the protocol answers what to find, based on a unique hash ID called the Content Identifier CID. This it acts like a fingerprint, ensuring each file is uniquely identified within the network. In the LMS, data uploaded by the user is stored in IPFS objects, which are like individual containers for each file. IPFS objects can store up to 256 kilobytes of data. If the data is larger than 256 kilobytes, it is divided into multiple IPFS objects, with each object linked to the next in a chain. Each IPFS object has two parts. The first part stores the actual data, while the second part stores the link to the next IPFS object in the chain. This allows for the storage of larger files by chaining multiple IPFS. Now. Let's take a look at the framework of the LMS's blockchain-enabled IPFS message handling system. In this framework, blockchain technology is used as a communication ledger, which ensures secure and transparent data exchange between users. Each time a user uploads a file into the system, a unique hash ID is generated. This hash ID, along with a secret key, is used to encrypt the data. To share the encrypted data with another user, it is sent as a non-fungible token NFT, message through the blockchain network. NFTs are unique digital assets that can represent ownership of various types of data, including encrypted data in the DLMS system. By using blockchain technology, DLMS ensures that all data exchanges are secure and transparent. The use of NFTs allows users to share encrypted data without compromising the security of the system, as each NFT is unique and represents ownership of a specific piece of encrypted data. In conclusion, the DLMS framework provides a decentralized alternative to traditional LMS that is more secure and sustainable and has the potential to revolutionize the way educational institutions manage and deliver educational content. The use of IPFS eliminates the need for centralized servers and reduces energy consumption, while smart contracts automate certain processes and ensure data integrity. However, challenges such as resistance to adoption by educational institutions and the need for further research into its impact on stakeholders remain. Future work for the LMS includes addressing these challenges and exploring new use cases in education. As the technology continues to evolve, we can expect to see more real-world implementations of the LMS and further research on its scalability and interoperability. We are excited to present the user interface for the LMS 
which is the platform that utilizes Ethereum smart contracts and IPFS to create a decentralized learning management system. Users such as educators and students can access to LMS through wallets like MetaMask, which store their keys and enable them to interact with the platform. Another important feature is the messaging system, which allows educators and students to communicate with each other through non-fungible tokens (NFTs). In addition, the LMS provides a feature that allows teachers to create assignments and for students to submit their work through the platform. This makes it easy for teachers to grade and provide feedback and for students to stay organized and on top of their coursework. File sharing among students is another feature of the LMS, which ensures easy collaboration and access to learning materials. Overall, the user interface of the LMS is designed to be user-friendly and intuitive, making it accessible for all users regardless of their technical expertise. We believe that our proposed system has the potential to revolutionize the way educational institutions operate, making it more accessible and beneficial for both students and educators. With the LMS, we believe we can improve the learning process and provide a better experience for all involved. Thank you for your attention. We hope you found our presentation on decentralized LMS informative. If you have any further questions or would like to discuss our idea further, please do not hesitate to contact us using the following information. Thank you again for your time, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. So this presentation was also awarded uh, during the student challenge of the P2834 uh, standard development on secure and trusted learning system. So uh, you, had, you have the contact information of the presenters. And also, uh, as I said, we will keep on uh, sustainable discussions among us. So thank you very much for listening. Yes, so the uh, information is uh, contained at the uh, last uh, part of the video. Also in the agenda, you have uh, the name of the of the authors, the Xavier and uh, Parvati, and they are uh, not connected right now, but they can answer questions later on. So we're going to, to double check if the previous presentation author is connected or not. So it's a uh, Dubé connected. If not, we proceed with uh, our next presentation. Uh, so we have the author of the next presentation of the agenda, uh, Guna Sekara and Chandipa is connected. Yes, they made a special yes. request. They will be okay. Both. So you have uh, said that you want to share the screen to present, and so one of you is going to be sharing, and the other one is going to be talking. Is is is, is right? Yes, exactly. So let's proceed. So what uh, your name is? Uh, Chandipa. I will be sharing. Okay. Uh, so go ahead and share the presentation. So first of all, uh, good evening, at least in my time to everybody joined synchronously and uh, hi. Um, we are the team converter that will be project, uh, presenting the following presentation. Our team members uh, include myself, Sachit and uh, Chandipa, who is presenting at the moment, and uh, Chanuka, uh, who is also in the meeting as well. So in recent years, conversational AI has made great strides uh, with the development of advanced language models such as ChatGPT and BARD. So today I'm excited to present to you Convorther, which is a project that leverages the power of conversational AI to enhance multi-factor authentication. Convert is not only a novel and innovative solution, but also a proven and validated one. In fact, we are pr proud to announce that our project has received a prestigious certification from the IEEE P2834 Student Challenge 2022, as we can see in this slide. So what is Converter and how does it work? In this presentation, I will give you an overview of our project and its main features. 
Converter is a conversational AI system that enhances multi-factor authentication by using NLP and voice recognition techniques. It allows users to verify their identity by having a natural and secure conversation with an AI agent, instead of entering passwords or codes for that matter. One of the standards met standard methods of multi-factor authentication is using face recognition as a password. However, we are going to argue that this method is flawed and inaccurate because it actually is a username, not a password. Face recognition is a natural and intuitive way for humans to identify each other. However, it is not reliable enough to verify each other. Verification requires more than just recognizing a face. It requires proving that the face belongs to the person who claims that it is. Face recognition cannot provide this proof because it can be easily fooled or compromised by various factors or attacks. Our claim that the face is a username is based on the fact that humans use their faces to identify each other. In this part of the demonstration, we will explain what this fact means and how it refers to authentication. Since we have already built up a case against face recognition, let's ask ourselves a simple question. Does our face re represent a username? In other words, does our face uniquely identify us? Or does it also verify us? Let's explore this question and see what answer we can grasp it. Imagine that you have a friend named John. You can recognize John by his face. His, he has some distinctive features that make him different from the other people. For example, he has blue eyes, a long nose, a scar on his cheek. His face is his username because it identifies him as John. However, it simply cannot be his password because it does not verify that he is John. Anyone who looks like John or has access to his face can pretend to be him or fool you. For example, someone could wear a mask or use a deep fake video to mimic John's face. His face is not secure or reliable enough to prove that he is John. But how can we use face recognition to enhance security and convenience since it, it has been used for a very long time? This is where Converter comes in. Converter is a novel system that combines face recognition with conversational cues to authenticate users. We will look at the impact that Converter can have on the field of biometric authentication. Converter not only has a positive impact on the field of biometric authentication, but also on the user experience. Converter offers convenience and ease for both authentication as well as authorization. So authentication is simply the process of verifying the identity of a user, while authorization is providing or granting access to resources for authenticated users. Converter utilizes multi-factor authentication, which is a method of verifying the user's identity by requiring two or more pieces of evidence. For demonstration, we will only be using SMS OTP as a factor of authentication, but Converter has the capability of integrating more than these factors when implemented as a release. Converter can also improve the user experience of software systems that are not critical for safety or security. These are systems that users can use for various purposes, such as entertainment, education, communication, or productivity. Converter can make these systems more usable by offering convenience and ease of authentication and authorization. So far, we have seen how Converter can have a positive impact on the field of biometric authentication, as well as on the user experience of systems. But how does Converter actually work? What goes under the hood? How does it use face recognition and conversational cues to authenticate users? In this section, we will look at the implementation of Converter we will start by explaining the face detection and recognition strategy that we have used, which is the first and foremost step of identifying the user who wishes to log into the system. We have approached three face recognition methods, eigenfaces, Fisher faces, and LBPH. These methods use different techniques to recognize faces from images and videos. We have tested these methods on various data sets and scenarios to evaluate their performance and their limitations as well. Let's take a closer look at two of them. 
the eigen phases and fissure phases they are based on the idea of linearly projecting images into a lower dimensional space however this idea also has a practical problem involved in terms of accuracy and the robustness of face recognition it is how can we determine the threshold value that we can use for identifying or distinguishing faces from each other so we thought of moving on to another framework that uses deep learning to achieve higher accuracies and also solve the practical problem involved that I mentioned earlier. The framework is called Deep Face, as you might have all experienced with the modern technologies, and it consists of four stages, which is detecting, aligning, representing, and verifying. In the initial detecting stage, it finds faces in an image or video, while in the aligning stage, it it adjusts the faces to a common position and orientation, while in the representing, sta re representing stage, it extracts features from the faces using a deep neural network. And finally, in the verifying stage, it compares the features of a face pair and outputs a similarity score. So deep face can handle different poses, illuminations, expressions, and occlusions. We will look at how Converter leverages SMS OTP as an additional factor of authentication. The user does not need to type the OTP, but instead say it aloud to Converter using voice recognition. But that's not the only method that Converter utilizes to secure the user's identity. It also uses speech recognition to confirm the user's identity by recognizing OTPs that are set by the user to Converter. In this segment, we will investigate how speech recognition functions and how Converter integrates it to optimize the authentication process. We initially experimented with the LSTM models, but it had low accuracy for our task. Therefore, we switched to the CNN model, which uses spectrograms of audio data as input, which in turn gave us better results with higher accuracy. Taking a closer look at the CNN's architecture and its performance, as you can see on the left screen, the image on the left side describes the model's architecture in terms of its layers and parameters. It, it was roughly 2 billion parameters that we had to involve with, the, with its architecture, while the image on the right portion of the screen describes about the training and validation process, which specifically shows about how the accuracy has increased over time. Well, this concludes the implementation specification on the speech recognition module on the speech using the CNN. And as part of the final implementation, we would like to speak about the conversational AI that integrates all of these separate modules into one seamless flow and how we can enhance the user experience. Conversational AI is simply the technology that enables machines to interact with humans using natural language processing. It can power various applications such as chatbots, voice assistants, and smart speakers. Chatbots are programs that simulate human conversation using text or voice. Modern chatbots use advanced AI techniques as ChatGPT, BARD, uh, to understand the user's intent and generate natural responses. On the display is uh, just one simple example of these modern chatbots. Moving on, one of the major advantages of conversational AI is that it eliminates the need to fill tedious forms. Instead of asking the user to enter their information in a fixed format, the chatbot can simply ask them natural questions and collect their responses in a conversational way. Another advantage is that the flow of the process feels much more convenient and natural. It can also handle multiple requests and switch between different topics seamlessly. This makes the user feel more engaged and satisfied with the service. Third, and finally, one of the major advantages that conversational AIs bring into the table is that there are no typos involved. Unlike typing, speaking or listening does not require spelling or grammar skills. The chatbot can understand the user's speech or text input regardless of any errors or variations. In the following slides, we have also prepared a few videos regarding how a chat GPT-3 chat GPT conversation flows, but we are just going to skip through them because we are completely uh, co comfortable with chat GPT nowadays. It's a huge hype, but we are happy to show the video just after the presentation if anybody is interested in it. 
When it comes to building a conversational AI, the obvious choice for a model is a large language model or LLM. These models can generate natural and fluent text-based text based on given input or context. We initially proposed the use of GPT-2 in our initial plan. However, since then, a new and more powerful model has been released, the GPT-3. But GPT-4 for that matter, which released very, very recently, but for our purposes, our convenient usage, GPT-3 would be fine. This model has many advantages over GPT-2 and other alternatives, such as higher accuracy, better diversity, and longer coherence. The process consists of three steps. First, the user converses with the chatbot to log in into the system. Second, the chatbot extracts the user information and authenticates it with the system. Thirdly, the chatbot converses with the user to extract information throughout the process. There are facial recognition, speech recognition, SMS, OTP verification, and user authentication. These processes work subsequently and seamlessly to ensure that the user is who they claim to be and to provide a secure and personalized conversational experience. This concludes our presentation on Converter, uh, which is a conversational AI system that uses large language models and multimodal verification methods. We hope you enjoyed learning about our project and its features. We would love to hear your feedback and answer any questions that you may have. Please feel free to raise your hand or type any questions that you have in the chat. Uh, we would be shared. We would love. We'd be glad to share whatever we have. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. So uh, you have the floor to ask questions since we have live presentation and interesting uh, 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 presentation that is also in the uh, uh, new trend of uh, challenges uh, with the venue of uh, chat, chat GPT. Okay, so that somebody has any question for Sashit or the team. This is a very interesting presentation. I have a short question for you. Um, uh, how are you managing um, if uh, people try to use pre-recorded voice combined with uh, uh, pre-recorded video of, of a person to try to fake uh, how the system behaves uh, when receives those inputs? Uh, this, this is one of the major questions, concerns when it comes to speech recognition and voice recognition is that uh, people try to actually have maybe an image or recorded, pre-recorded, as you mentioned, and try to, you know, fool the system. So what we have uh, added as, uh, as a precaution is to use an SMS OTP. So when the user is verified, maybe a recording, maybe a voice, uh, I mean, an image, but the user needs to have his mobile phone. We will be integrating his mobile phone into the system. So a person without his mobile phone will not be able to log into the system. So you might be authenticated using a pre-recorded voice or maybe the face, but the OTP is, uh, is actually necessary for you to be authenticated into the system to log into the system. It is what we have used, but I mean, Converter has the capability of involving any other factors of authentication. Interesting, and yes, and that's that's I think the key. It's uh, when we have the chance to combine combine different methods of authentication, and uh, once we combine most than one or two, is when we create a strong uh, system of authentication and future authorization to access protected objects. So thank you so much. Uh, is there any okay. question from the audience? Thank you, and uh, as we said also, you are welcome also to participate to our uh, uh, standard development. And also if you have some ideas or, or uh, starting a new standard, or uh, uh, you can also contact Luis Felipe, he's a chair of uh, uh, Education Society Standard Committee. So we, we are, we'll be happy that also get student 
leaders starting their own, a, a standard and we as educators, researchers, and uh, uh, we are like happy, we are enablers, in, enablers. So we, can, we are happy also to mentor, to give advice and also to participate to your, your, uh, your initiatives. So you are welcome to, uh, to uh, if you have some ideas to, 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 to lead something. Thank you, Dr. Hamadou. We will definitely keep in touch with that. Yeah, that sounds interesting. Yeah, we'll do yeah, that. Yeah. Thank you very a much. Final question. Final question is uh, how far are you in the level of implementation of these uh, two? Um, in terms of implementing, I think we have uh, uh, just integrated separate modules. Uh, I would say as a percentage, we are done with almost 50% uh, of the project. We just have to connect it all together so that the system has a seamless flow within it. That sounds good. So we can keep uh, the discussion also after the, the event and uh, see how these can fit uh, in the future standards for IEEE from IEEE Education Society, which is uh, what we are um, managing right now and what we have and where we have a scenario of application for this type of, of solutions. So thank you so much and congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. So we're going to continue with the agenda for the day. Let me just share with you the agenda and the screen again, and we can continue from there. Um, Uh, Ayusha Shah, it is a video link and slides. Are you here? Are you presenting or you prefer this the video? So we have both the slides and the, the video. So maybe for from Ayusha. Ayusha Shah, six, solidity-based authentication using smart contract. So our next presentation, yes. So Ayusha Shan, I, yeah, we saw him connected, uh, but we can proceed with the video if, if um, we have it here. So we're going to proceed with the video of Ayushia Shan. Uh, the video is a title or the presentation is titled uh, Solidity Based Authentication Using Smart Contract NFTs. So I'm going to, to share the, 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 the video and uh, we will continue with this uh, session. Hello, I'm Aisha Shine today I'll be presenting on solidity-based authentication using smart contract NFT. So first is my certificate citation. Now just a few stats before I start. $27.5 billion is what the Web3 market capitalization was in early 2022. 5.5 million active user wallets in Ethereum exist and there's a 706% increase of crypto activity in Asia in the fiscal year of 2020. This is where Saskin comes in. Decentralized authentication for Ethereum based blockchain. First, a bit about me. I'm Ayusha Shah. I'm a web specialist, Web3 developer, cyber security, and marketing enthusiast. Now, a few problems which were there is the first thing whenever you think about non fungible tokens or NFTs, things that come into your mind are CryptoPunk, The Merge, and Board Apes. Honestly, these are all just underutilization of NFTs because people forget that the core concept of NFT is data and code. Also, there is an unavailability of a proper Web3 based verification. There is usually centralization in all of these kind of authentication and all of those things. And shared identification such as OAuth is not actually available for Web3. 
some of the advantages of the solution i am about to propose is that it is extremely cost effective it is extremely secure because again it's going to be on the blockchain so because of that reason it is going to be having one of the best encryptions or hashing available it is decentralized because it's on the blockchain and it's going to be extremely easy to use so my solution is saskin which is solidity based authentication using smart contract nft now here what is going to happen is that i'm going to be developing an nft using solidity which is going to be compatible with ethereum and matic or polygon and it is going to help in the authentication in all of these blockchains now just like a small scenario we have john here on the left and he is going to be doing a degree online so it's going to be like a home degree now here there are going to be a lot of things which are going to be provided by the college which is going to be something like quizzes lectures notes and all of those things so here they have to make sure that it is him and it is not some hacker or someone else and here is where saskin comes in so first let us like just go ahead a bit with the usage i'll just be moving myself a bit down here yeah so just a bit with the usage so for the college they'll just have to create an account on our site and they can do that by just easily signing a message using their ethereum wallet after that the next thing that they can do is that they can choose the nft configuration so there are a lot of nft standards provided by ethereum so they can choose erc1155 they can choose erc721 they can choose all of those things they can choose the image they want to display some of the functions and the metadata whatever is necessary next after that they're going to be choosing the authentication method so the user will have some way that they can authenticate using this nft it can be probably using a facial recognition it can be using a fingerprint or anything as such after that they are going to be typing in the list of ids and wallet addresses if it is a 721 a bulk mint thing can take place so all of the nfts can be distributed at once and for erc1155 you can have a proper link which can be generated and via that link the students can then claim their nft now for the student they will receive their nft for 721 it will directly be there in the accounts in 115 they'll be going to the page they'll be making the transaction and then they'll be receiving their nft after they'll be redirected to our website in which they can complete the authentication method which was specified before which was you know you could say facial recognition fingerprint or anything they come to our website and they can complete that process after they, they'll go back to the original site and they can continue and they can be authenticated this redirect part where they'll have to complete the authentication like scanning the face and all will not always be necessary it can also happen on the client side website just for the first time they'll have to come to our website that's all now let's go towards a practical scenario we have a university nfto in which we have the face recognition after that they can use some kind of authentication like you can say face recognition and then the data will be filled inside of the nft it's an erc721 my name would be there the image what i want to display will be there and the url for all of the metadata will be there function your aes256 is basically the encryption algorithm which i'll be using so what will happen is that on the web this nft can be there which can later also be signed with the wallet along with the face recognition and this way the user can easily be authenticated there are two universities they can also make a deal together and they can use a single nft because again it's on the blockchain data is available to everyone if they just share a few keys everything will be possible now let's move more towards the reality the technologies which will be used here will be python web 3 js and web 3 py which can be used for the communication of the system with the blockchain you'll be having metamask also which will be there on the client side and you'll be having aes and sha which can be aes 256 and sha 256 which will be used for encryption and hashing respectively down here on the bottom i have a screenshot of open zeppelin via which you can easily make contracts and then later you can export them to remix to edit them easily here on the top right, I also have one of the Python packages, which is the face recognition package. Here, if you could just see, you give it an input and then it will give you a kind of an output. It can also be used to match two faces, which we have. Now the phases are how this project can be developed and deployed. First, we'll be having the research part, 
which is done. Then after it, we'll be having the web part in which we'll be programming the whole web interface. Then you have the NFT in which you properly program the NFT so that it is compatible with the system I just spoke about. Then you have the authentication methods, which you can use that Python package for uh, the face recognition and various other packages to put a proper authentication in place along with the NFT. And finally, the deployment stage. The impact of this is going to be great because it's going to provide billions of Web3 users with a secure and decentralized way for fast authentication. Thank you. Thank you to the author. Um, it's a very interesting presentation too, as all that we have had using NFTs as a authentication method. And I believe the author is not connected today uh, at this moment, or if it is connected, uh, we will be uh, send you, sending you the questions. Um, I think, Yes, he's not, he's not in the list right now. So uh, if you have any question to the author, remember the contact is in the agenda, also in the video. Uh, we're going to be sharing this with you at the end of the presentation. So the idea is to uh, keep the interaction uh, among participants and um, discussing um, these, these interesting approaches to uh, tackle security in this case of authentication for uh, systems. So yes, thank Dr. you Hamad, very you much. I said also, I said also uh, keep us in the loop. So we are enable enablers uh, of uh, discussions and networking. So it is important for us to have all together to co-construct what we called virtual graduate study consortium. These activities is part of the the initiative that uh, we are uh, moving forward, and your inputs are important for us to get what is your idea of virtual graduate studies con study consortiums. Correct. Thank you, Dr. Hamadou. So this is a, a very good contribution. So. Uh, the smart contracts uh, and the authentication for supporting you know, to support authentication system uh, in this in systems it's a really interesting idea uh, i will be looking forward to see how the performance is how the um, the power of of um, nfts or the security on the uniquely identifiable devices can be, uh, these tokens can be used as, as authentication methods. So um, next is going to be a met for Khan that is connected uh, in the list of participants that is going to be presenting brain frequency based evolutionary encryption method for IoT devices. So uh, Ahmed is connected uh, right now, so we're going to give the floor to Ahmed to continue to do his presentation. Ahmed, are you? Thank you so much, sir. Can I share my screen right now? Probably. Yes. All right. Okay. Are you able to see my screen? Correct. All right, sir. Uh, first of all, as you said, my presentation topic is the brain frequency based evolutionary encryption methods for the IoT devices. And I am really glad to getting to that rewards from you. Thank you so much again. And first of all, I want to start with the aim of the proposal system. Actually, we are trying to encrypt any data with using the brain signals. And in my dissertation, we, we are focused to the IoT devices because the IoT devices is going usable for day by day. And approximately today, we have uh, 14.4 billion IoT devices in the world. And uh, the total market share is approximately $21.3 billion. And we are... Uh, paying approximately $3.1 billion for the security of the IoT devices. Uh, 
and uh, the basically an IoT devices usable for everywhere. For example, if you have a smart home system, when you wake up, your coffee maker will create will prepare the your coffee and your window going to be uh, transparent or the, your air con conditioner can understand uh, your body temperature and then it can start automatically. And IoT devices are using the sensors for the doing to those jobs. And uh, there's uh, some statistics about two uh, IoT devices. And this one is represents uh, 2020 and the 2022 country spending and the usage areas of the IoT devices. And most of them is using for the outdoor surveillance systems. Also the police departments are using for your road, road and the traffic management systems. And also the city asset tra tracing uh, is the approximate $3 billion we are spending for that topic too. And this one is, uh, showing the estimating fees can be spent on the IoT device security uh, globally and most of them using for the professional services because you know the we always have got trouble with those devices actually and also the gateway security is approximately 415 million dollars for a yearly and also we are paying and uh, endpoint security for $631 million. And this table is representing to attack types through the IoT devices. And the most known is the DOS or the DDoS attacks through the IoT devices, also men in the middle or RF jamming, uh, tech cloning, all those are the attack types through the IoT devices. And as I said before, we are trying to create an encryption system for the, any communication system or the, any uh, devices like such as the IoT devices, but this one is representing basically what an encryption methods do. And for example, you have an eLab and you are sharing the, your voice or your video or your documents even we are uh, doing to that Zoom meeting, I am just sharing to my presentation and my voice. An encryption method can convert those data for an understandable way. And uh, if you have a key, you can understand those inputs. And for making secure systems, we are actually using the two different uh, techniques. And the first one is the symmetric and the second one is the asymmetric encryption systems. The symmetric encryption system using the one key for both encryption and the decryption, but an asymmetric uh, encryption methods, it could be a little bit different because we had the two keys, which are the public and the private keys. And all those encryption methods using the complex numbers for the making secure systems. And this one is also the, another representation of the symmetric and asymmetric encryption systems. The main problems, as I said before, we are using the complex numbers and the, the, those calculation of those co complex numbers is, you know, the making the power consumption and uh, handle the, those issues, the scientists creating the two different methods such as uh, hybrid and lightweight encryption methods. And the hybrids and lightweight encryption methods are actually some modification of the uh, those two encryption methods. Also, we have the uh, quantum encryption methods, but you know this one is a real long. Uh, it can take a little more time for the explaining to those uh, methods for the secure uh, the systems. And this one is a summary of the uh, encryption system using in IoT devices right now. And as we say, the all of the lightweight and the hybrid encryption systems derivated from the symmetric or the asymmetric uh, encryption methods. And in my paper, we have some summary about you. Uh, which encryption methods are highly used in IoT devices and last five years and uh, their categorization of the 
is that encryption method system uh, symmetric or symmetric hybrid or reliable. And also we have the, some statistic about you know, how they are secured IoT devices and uh, probably you know the most of them is not uh, giving the hundred percent secure for the devices. And the main problem is if you are creating a secure system, you have to uh, pay more cost. And uh, if you are uh, trying to a less costly system, you have to uh, skip the security or efficiency about your encryption methods. And this is the main problem for the all uh, secure systems right now. And our, our purpose is creating an efficient, secure, but less cost system for IoT devices. And uh, after that part, I will talk about the brain uh, signals. And this one is the representation of our brain cortex and the functions. Actually, we have approximately five or the six different regions in our brain and each of them is using for the different functions. For example, if you have some uh, motor cortex like frontal lobe, it's using for the, when you drive your car or when you write writing something, all of them is the, represent about the frontal cortex. Of course, we have the parietal lobe, which is uh, using for perception or spiritual relations or uh, hunger, pain, temperature, illness, etc. And this one is explaining how we are creating the signals in the brain actually, but it's really hard to explain in the 15 minutes. But as a summary, I can say that uh, we have uh, some matters in our brain, like such as the sodium and the potassium. And when you think about something, the Potassium and the sodium is changing to their side, and this even creating the our brain signals. A little brief summary, actually. And for the measure those signals, we are using the, an EEG device, and uh, which is the Emotive Insight 2.0, and it has the five different electrodes located through your school. And this is an, uh, one representation of the where is the our, uh, can I use the, any pen something, leather pointer, all right. If you see over here, we had two different electrodes on the, our frontal side on our school, which is the AF3 and AF4. Also, we had two different electrodes for the, our right temporal and the left temporal cortexes. Also, we have the partial cortex electrodes over here, which is connected to really middle of your school. And uh, maybe you can ask about the, how we are uh, we are trusting to that device. Actually, there's some uh, survey about to those emotive devices are really similar to medical uses EEG devices. And this is a representation about how your brain signals looks like in uh, emotive device. As I said before, we have the AF3, AF4, and the T T8 and the T7 and the PS. And you're able to see how your ideas or your thoughts is uh, changing the frequencies. And this one is the representation of working schema of the proposal system. Actually, you you all or the, we have some memories, right? For example, you can imagine about your graduation or movie or car and uh, each memory has the details. Like if you are think, think about your graduation, you can remember your friends or the family members are attending to your graduation. Each layer, when you detail, when you make the detail of your memory, you are creating some signals. And for example, if you are thinking about a movie, you can remember the good and the bad characters in that movie. And if you think about the good characters, maybe you can, it can make you happy, motivate something. And it's really working like that. 
and the right side is a representation about you, how your memory is coming through your brain and how it's creating the sound signals and how they are uh, separating all of the different top, subtopics of the, your signals. And as a summary, if you remember that we told about you uh, some symmetric and asymmetric encryption systems, right? Actually, they are can, they can be represented uh, in this figure too. For example, you have a door latch, and uh, you have the one only key, and this key is using for the unlock or the lock to your doors. Those images are representing about to our uh, experiments. We have the four different images which are uh, selected by me. And uh, you know, the common feature of those images, we have uh, some drawers for each image. And we're gonna use that specification of those images in the, our experimental design. In our experiment, this one is a representation about to you how our experiment looks like, actually. We have the, just we uh, assume that we had just only two subjects, all right? For the first subject, we are showing the, our first image, which is uh, this one, for 15 seconds. And uh, 10 seconds is only the blank screen. And we are using that blank screen for the uh, eliminating the artifact, but it's not matter right now. We are just showing the first picture to the, our first subject for 60 seconds, and we are recording all of the EEG signals of the, our uh, subject. At the second step, we are showing the second picture and then third picture. But the, before the fourth picture, we are telling that you have an imaginary wallet and please try to hide that wallet in the image. For example, as I said before, the fourth image is a key, right? I'm just thinking about I have a wallet and I'm trying to hide it. May I can uh, put my wallet over here as an imaginary uh, thinking, you know? And the second subject, also, we are showing to all of the images, but right now we are just changing the order of those images. And right now is a fourth image going to be this one for the subject two. And also we are telling that please try to uh, think about do you have imaginary wallet and you are just trying to hide it. And probably he or she tried to hide that wallet over here or that area, etc. Actually, at this step, we are creating the door latch for each subject. If you remember the, that image, it was a classical encryption method, which is using only one key for the locking and the unlocking the doors. But right now, we are creating specific door latch for each subject. At the second phase of the, that experiment, we are showing the, those images again, but that time is 30 seconds. That means, if you remember that, it was approximately one minute, right? And we create latches, but this time we are showing the same images for the 30 seconds and we are recording them with a key. And for example, the subject one is, we already got the one minute record of the, all of those images and the subject one is height is already, her is wallet over here. And in the second phase, we are also showing to those same images, but right now he or she knew that his wallet or the hers wallet over here, and it creating some specific the signals. And right now, when we are investigate how the signals and signals of the one minute and the 30 seconds records looks like in this way. Uh, as you see over here, even we have the less uh recording for the 30 seconds but that's the is higher than the one minute records and but this specifications is only for the key images where is the key and the ledge is match for example d and d match your density is higher than the and others 
And for example, for the subject 007, selecting the picture C, which is the one minute and 30 seconds is the same image, density is higher. But if we change the one minute C image and 30 seconds to D image, we are able to see that all of the one minute density is higher than another's. Also, this one is in representation about to how our brain signals uh, looks like in the electrode based. It just creating some grouping or a clustering over here, right? And if we are mixture to those models, it looks like in this way. However, if we change C and B, which are the C is ledge, but B is another key, we are able to see this some you know, sketches over here, just real different, right? And we are trying to calculate all of those uh, changing in the signals. Also, this one is a representation about to, you know, this one is a technical background of how we are able to measure all of those uh, changings. For example, we had two subjects and the first subject select to image C and we are combining all of the uh, Im 30 seconds images. And also we are combining to another subjects files. Also, we have the, some combination of the, our electrodes and we are just separating out to our records through the combination of the electrodes and we are sending through the, the Gaussian uh, mixture models and then we are just creating some clusters and the clusters giving to some uh, results like that and we are just filtering them and then finding to which channel combination is giving the match where is the key and the ledge uh, are matching but as I said before this is a technical background and it really kind of takes to explain to all of the steps but if we are all right is it possible to running this one let I try to yes if we are using the same ledge and the match key we are able to find where is the key where is the nuts and this one is a representation about to our, our experiment which is using the YOLO version 5 and as you see over here when a subject think about to his memory which is the selected by uh, as a door ledge we are able to find which memory is selecting at those steps and it's giving to you some results as a this yes the, those signals looks like as a key or not and this one is the a part of the why we are calling them evolutionary method the actually when you try to open your gate in the first time with your brain signals it just creating some uh, connection between to your uh, neurons and the second step will create the, another neurons it's going to be so on that means the first time your password is the for the 64 uh, bits but after the maybe 10 or the 20 steps it's going to be like 2000 for the eight bits etc there, there is no five we are just calling the evolutionary method and uh, if it can be asked about why you select you to brain signals because they, they are unique for the each person. And if we are compared with to another biological encryption methods like to fingerprint and a face recognition, and we know that the face recognition is a partial unique because you know the you if you have the twin, that means you have the same face actually. And the brain signals are not imitable because you know you can use another uh, bypass methods for the emit any fingerprints or we know some deep fake applications are able to creating the face recognition system also the brain signals are, are numer numerical data but the, your fingerprints or the face recognition are proposed uh, processed data and also the brain signals are dynamic not static that mean 
the brain signals are changing to every seconds and but your fingerprints or your face are static there's no any changing the major changing actually if you are not getting the surgery etc also in the brain signals we are getting a multiple inputs what that the multiple inputs actually we are able to calculate where you are stressed or where you are in the interest attention relation with using your brain signals and actually those are really useful for the every steps of the that encryption method for example if you are using the that system in your e-lab the instructor can understand which student has an interest in this topic and then you know the instructor can shape the continue of that course later or for example you are just using the that system at your smart home system and there's a, some thief trying to break your door and your brain signals automatically calculate your stress level. And if your stress level is really high, it can be called the police department automatically, et cetera. Yes, actually that's all, but please keep in your minds, just I am trying to explain approximately 250 pages project uh, in the, 15 minutes. If you don't understand any uh, point, you can ask any questions or you can make uh, some comments about that project. Thank you so much again for the reward and the, for this uh, event. Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, Ahmed, for your uh, presentation. With uh, many challenging challenging uh, task within this big project, but uh, it shows us how from simple uh, concept of uh, encryption, we can bring also the brain into the, uh, the loop of, uh, of security. Uh, we, uh, Luis Felipe also asked, about uh, you if you have question you can also drop them in the chat uh, window and also you have uh, Ahmed contact uh, so that uh, that will be help helpful for to create a kind of dynam dynamic dynamic uh, a process of uh, moving forward uh, Ahmed, you have only a question. one question yes uh, but it is very challenging. How the health of the uh, of someone can affect like uh, this uh, uh, issue of uh, bringing uh, the health, like bringing uh, security and health signal for security. Actually, this is the last part of the, our uh, dissertation, and uh, as you know, there is some. Uh, RTL STR systems is trying to, uh, you know, the, there's some approaches like to signal reply, right? And they are can duplicate any signals. For example, they are able to hacking the in a drone system with uh, receiving the signals and uh, using the replay attack. But the issue in that proposal system is that our brain is creating the signals with the very low uh, frequency bands. For example, a radio signal is between to 81.0 to 100.7 megahertz, right? But our brain signals locate in the 0 0.80 hertz line. Let I try to show you. Where is that? All right, those are the various that our brain signals are located in. And actually, for example, your theta waves are in the four and eight hertz frequency range, or our uh, highest frequency range is a 30, which is the probably theta. And 
this is really hard to duplicate those signals and sending back, back through the, our IoT device. And, you know, our brain is creating 128 different values for one second. That means it should be 128 different RTL STR system should be locating for those attack scenarios. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will not continue because we need to move forward, but uh, very interesting. And uh, uh, you don't, you don't, you don't have to to answer, but uh, you talk about electrodes. Uh, yes. uh, that means also we should get some devices that are like seamless. Uh, like uh, watches or something that uh, can get us uh, or ha or heart or something that will get, get us like seamless uh, information about the brain signal instead of getting like real electrodes uh, uh, in uh, to get the information but this is interesting uh, uh, work you are doing Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, just one secondly, uh, can you two images generate the same signal? The actually, uh, as I said before, we are using some combinations for the subject, and it's not possible to, possible to creating the same signals for the same images with the different uh, subject. Okay. Thank you so much again, and bye bye. Thank you so much, uh, Ahmed. Uh, very interesting presentation. I see the challenges on implementation and how this uh, innovative idea um, will have uh, more iterations of uh, future implementations. And uh, that's something that uh, you might be thinking about uh, how this is going to be implemented uh, in practical scenarios of, of use. So, but thank you so much. It's a really, really interesting project. So I'm going to, to proceed with the next uh, person in the agenda, next participant. So we are on a schedule. Um, it's uh, Jose Baca Bustillo, uh, design, of an, design and implementation of a online laboratory composer tool. This work was also participating in the December event for the VGSC. So, Jose Baca, if you have your, your presentation ready, eh, please go ahead. Yes, I have it ready. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, are you able to maybe increase the volume of your microphone a little bit? Uh, is this better? Okay. Um, see my screen. Yes. Okay. Um, good morning. Um, I'm Jose Bacamstillo, and today I'm going to be presenting about the Smart Adapter Remote Laboratories uh, and the design of the composer. Um, or we also uh, abbreviate it as a SARL. So I had the chance to participate on the kickoff workshop on December, and I'm grateful to do that. I've been coming better at presenting. Uh, so the composer uh, is following the IEEE 1876-2018 uh, standard. Uh, this is a standard that defines the guidelines for the design, development, and deployment, and management of, of the smart learning objects. Uh, we focus on interoperability, accessibility, and usability with a common data model and communication protocols. It also includes the guidelines for architecture and the design principles, such as the metadata schema, the life cycle management, deployment, uh, and integration accessibility, the usability, the security and the privacy that aims to promote the development of high quality smart learning objects that can be shared and reuse. Uh, it can also be integrated into various online learning environments. 
uh, it provides a framework for creating and using smart learning objects that can enhance the learning experience for students. Uh, the standard provides information that offers the first level, the first level standard for any um, online laboratories as a service or known as LAS. Uh, on the composer metadata, some of the information that we uh, take in consideration is uh, uh, such as the online lab, uh, the title, uh, the description of this lab, the and some contact information as well as some um, Some other uh, applications that this laboratory can have uh, or uh, resources that it can provide. Uh, we can also list up uh, the application program interface. Um, we do an authorization mechanism allowing the access to the service, and we have a concurrent access mechanism managing possible multiple access requests simultaneously to the same resource. And these are some of the tables that the IEEE um, standard provides. And we are currently on the use of when developing the uh, the composer. And most of the um, um, fields that we encounter and they are uh, more general to it is the title, like I was saying, as a description. Uh, we want to know the terms of of the service. Uh, we want to have a contact information in case of a faulty online lab. Uh, we want to know the license of this lab. Um, in the sensor metadata, we want to know uh, the full name of the sensor, uh, description on how can be used, the, the protocol that is using, uh, some procedures, what type of sensor values we have, and some configurations if 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 possible to do it through the online access. Um, and actuators, actuators are motors, any anything that you can interact with it, and can send um, send type of table as the sensors. In how is this helpful to the in the pedagogical support? Uh, it provides with guidelines to design and develop based on the learning theories and best practices, as well as the metadata schema to ensure that the smart learning objects are appropriately described and can be discovered and reused by others. In accessibility and usability, the standard ensures that the smart learning objects are usable by all the students regardless of their abilities. Uh, additionally, it provides the guidelines for security and privacy to ensure that smart object learning, smart learning objects, I'm sorry, are safe and secure for students to use. Uh, we can have some, uh, some of the common pedagogical support also resources are the lab assignments, uh, some course content, and external content and assessments. Um, the composer, uh, we have two types of composers. One of the composer is the experiment composer. Uh, these will access to the station and will create a new experiment. And these, uh, this is a collection of metadata to be able to auto-generate this experiment for the student. Um, and this is used by either the TAs, the teacher assistants, or the professor itself. So he can uh, change his experiments, uh, publish them, unpublish, unpublish them from their course content or gallery. Um, they can publish their, their course gallery to the university. That way, students can have access to a public gallery or 
remove it from there too. Um, on the Lab Station Composer, this is where we basically are, are collecting the, the metadata where uh, we can interact with the um, with the IoT device. The, it has been um, developing in an university or any company that is developing online labs. So our composer uh, uh, gives us the access and and the easiness of bringing your lab to life using your own experiment, giving access to multiple users. Um, I'll, I will be presenting um, a live demo at the end. Um, so some of the future work that we are working on is using the field programmable gay arrays. Um, this can uh, give you access to a hardware emulation um, in remote control and high performance computing. On the hardware emulation, uh, this can be used to emulate various hardware circuits, allowing online labs users to perform real world experiments remotely. Uh, the use of these FPGAs in online labs can provide a high degree in accuracy and flexibility in circuit emulation, allowing users to experiment with complex hardware systems in safe and cost effective manner. In the remote control, uh, this can be programmed to interface with various of sensors, motors, and other hardware devices, allowing for remote controllers and monitoring of physical experiments. Uh, these online labs can, can use the FPGAs to remotely control and monitor physical experiments, enabling students and researchers to access and experiment with real hardware systems from anywhere in the world. In the, the FPGAs are, can be used for high performance computing applications, such as image and signal processing, machine learning, and cryptography. Uh, Online labs can be uh, leveraged to provide students and researchers with the access and resources enabling to perform complex simulations and experiments that will otherwise be difficult or impossible to perform. Uh, the use of the FPAs in online laboratories can enhance the user experience, improve the quality of the experiments and provide access to high performance computing resources, all while reducing the cost and the increase of the accessibility. Uh, this is uh, um, a future work to implement in Tailscale. Um, Tailscale is, the, is a modern VPN uh, alternative that allows remote access to private network resources without compromising the, our network. And with, also without giving us the tedious work of going into our modern and open a port and so this allows us to just install an application, set up our, our accounts and set up our PPM and it will give you access to uh, the outside world without, compromise our, without compromising our network. Um, you can provide the secure access to the Internet of Things devices um, and personal computers if you're using a personal computer but it's mostly used by remote teams and companies to securely connect to on-premise or cloud-based resources. Um, you can have uh, interconnectivity with websites and local labs without opening ports, like I'm saying. And we are able to access the IP camera protocol. Uh, the protocol that we are implementing right now is um, RSTP which is real streaming time protocol, uh, real time stream protocol. And this can have a delay and it's usually a five to seven seconds, but in an online lab, we want to be more, more like real time. And an IP camera gives us a, a, a small delay, sometimes even in more, more like a real time. And this is why I, I'm trying to, uh, implement this private VPN. 
Um, we're also looking onto the security uh, aspect in the online lab uh, resource. Uh, we want to have a strong authentication and access control mechanism to ensure that only app authorized users can access the lab station. Uh, this includes strong passwords or two-factor authentications and role-based access controls. Um, we will need to secure the lab station network infrastructure with proper firewall configurations, instruction detection and prevention systems, and regular and regular vulnerability scans. Uh, we want to implement data encryption, both at the REST and in transit to protect sensitive data from unit, unauthorized access or theft. This also includes proper data backup and recovery mechanism to ensure that the data is no loss or in case of a disaster. And we want to ensure that all software and systems are kept up kept up to date with regular security updates and patches to prevent vulnerabilities from being exploited. Uh, now I'm going to uh, uh, go into my demo. Um, this is the front page of the uh, lapping a window. Uh, um, we have access to our, as a student, we will have access to the lab galleries. I have uh, my reports because I have a, a, a role model that is uh, in, in admin base. Um, so if we go to the composer, we are presented with the composer landing page. This landing page is where we can see or we can compose a new laboratory station or we can compose a new experiment. So if we go and compose a new experiment, we are presented with the form in which we have to give uh, our title or description of this experiment. Uh, this uh, image that is being presented here is so we can have access to um, we can see the image on the front page for this experiment, just like this one. Um, then we are presented into, when we click next, we're presenting on where we are going to be asking the activity. Uh, these activities can be, uh, we can create a table, we can do drawing, we can do a true table, uh, we can do a short answer, external URL, a sequential circuit table and programming. Um, this is, yeah. And with the programming is something new that we have implemented. Uh, we can have a block where we are giving a source code. This is the input we can compile. And if we have an error, it's going to either crash or, and give you the error in the detection. Uh, we can, um, on this activity, we also want a description. We want to know how difficult the activity will be, the content, uh, and we can implement a uh, activity type with a specific lab station and which we can define which, uh, what do we want to enable or disable from a particular lab station. Um, we can have multiple uh, activities and at the end of the activities, um, we can provide with the, um, with the average uh, difficulty level and to the review lab. And this, this essentially is going to give you a preview on how it's going to look right now. It's just a, a summary of what you have done during your input. And then once you're, once you're happy with your uh, lab, you can finish. And it's going to tell you that you successfully uh, uh, created this new SSLO. And then we can see it in, in our uh, main page where, and, but it hasn't been published to our gallery yet. And here's where we can publish, we can delete it, 
we can try it. So if we try it, it is, right now it doesn't generate it because I didn't do anything. But let's uh, let's say I want to try this one. We can see that it yeah, generated two activities. Um, uh, this one has a true table activity and it has uh, access to a remote lab station. Um, we have um, we can load the video, so now we're able to see our lab station. Uh, we can interact with buttons, and uh, I click on wise. It, it's like I saying if there is a delay, and then now we see the change. Um, there is in the true table we have the ability to uh, change an answer. It keeps updating the saving, and then we can check answer, and we can have a, a score that we can use for our um, PDF report. So in the so in the student uh, view, this is a gallery presented. Uh, for intro to introduction to logic design at FAU, the Florida Atlantic University. And one of the first labs we always encourage the students to do is the, the first lab, lab 00. And this is just to give uh, the student the ability to get used to the how the experiment works in online. Um, here, we can use the uh, draw IO tool and where we can update, uh, upload a picture, and we can save, save and exit, and we will have our new image generated. In here, uh, same, this is the, uh, this is another uh, experiment that we have with the same remote lab. This one encourages to have a, a hardware in our end so if uh, right now i have connected my my uh, arduino so we can read an nano id uh, i can generate a color in this case it's magenta and if i pull my switches on and type on read i will see my switches binary and then i will see also the change on on, on the image again there is a delay uh, we will see the change, and here is the change. Uh, that's one. Then the other one, uh, we can go back here. We can see the lab zero. Uh, this is the first lab that they have to submit, the students. Uh, they can go into uh, each activity. And all of these activities are being saved. So in case the student doesn't want to continue with a specific activity, it can come back later on, and these answers are going to be there always. Um, so when they're done, they can generate a, a lab report. And this is our lab report format that we have generated. It, it brings the, the user, like who generated this. If he has a device ID, it will come and get the device ID. Um, then it prints the each activity, as we can see. Uh, one of the benefits that this one, uh, in particular, uh, this PDF has is that we cannot print it because once we print it, there is a security flaw that they can save it as a PDF. And when they save it as a PDF, they can go into um, Adobe Acrobat, uh, the pro version, and they can change their name. And that can be a, a cheating um, aspect from the PDF. But if we save this, and um, I want to open the, they don't have Acrobat. Let me see if I can pull up the properties on OP permissions. So we can see that we cannot edit the content, uh, print, sign, or comment. Uh, we can just see the content uh, and 
we can copy the content, but this is not uh, it's not going to generate the lab report in our in our uh, server. So if the if a student submits a copy of this experiment, we will know that he didn't do the generation of the of the PDF. And another uh, another one is let's see. So here uh, we can see that we are able to see the author's name. And this is being generated by the server. And we know that the creator was slapping a window. So if we don't see these uh, parameters, we are immediately going to flag the student as he was cheating. Um, we know the location and everything. So it's something that we can, we have uh, taken consideration for PDF uh, submission when it comes to the student end. Uh, and this finalizes my my presentation. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jose Baca, for your uh, interesting presenter. That is uh, in the framework of uh, a, a, our uh, emer a standard. Uh, the winning, uh, the award-winning uh, standard that was uh, adopted and accepted in 2019. Uh, we are also st still working on uh, uh, the uh, uh, maintenance of this standard, and you are all welcome to contribute and uh, be part of this uh, uh, standard development. Uh, that is uh, that needs also security and also use cases. So all of you are invited to contact us about uh, the uh, standard, the first standard developed by Education Society uh, that is going to to evolve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hamadou Jose Waka, for your um, presentation. Uh, I've seen you have made. Uh, good progress on your uh, implementations and very innovative uh, interactions. So thank you so much for your your presentation. So we're going to continue. If you if somebody has any additional question for Jose, uh, feel free to ask him in the chat, and uh, and uh, we will translate those questions to to Jose if we receive it. Thank you so much. So next presentation. It's a, a Kushi Gupta uh, who's connected Kushi, and the presentation title is on the security and privacy of social media applications, a pedagogical approach. So if uh, Kushi is connected, that I believe it is, it, it, yeah. she is. It so uh, please. Uh, uh, go ahead with your your presentation. You can share the screen anytime. Um. Okay. Sorry. Um. So I'm using the browser version of Zoom, but um, for some reason I cannot share my um, presentation. I'm not sure why. Um, I can uh, pass the slides for you if, if. Yes, please. If that's possible, I really appreciate. Let me see if we have uh, your uh, submission. I don't have your slides here. Can you pass those slides to me and I can pass it? Um, okay. Um, I, sorry, one second. I think I got them. Oh, okay. Yes, we can see it now.
Hello, Kushi. Cannot hear you. Kushi, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can okay, you, you stop sharing the screen? Yes, I did. Sorry. Um, I was just wondering what was. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. We can hear you, and we were able to see your slides before. We can see your slide. But we cannot hear you now. Um, sorry about that. Uh, can I quickly join from my laptop, if that's okay? No problem, yes. Um, do you want to maybe move on and then I can quickly join from my laptop again? Okay, can you check to see if uh, uh, the presenter on uh, uh, Dubai is, Prince Deep Dubai is here? Yes, I'm here, I'm here. Okay, are you ready to present? Yes. Okay, so please uh, do that. All right, let me share my screen. So we're going to switch presentation while uh, Kushi Gupta fixed the, the connection. So we're gonna go with um, uh, Dubé. Web class attention and authentication system is the title. And we're going to go with this presentation and we're gonna have a Kushi's group presentation after. All right, can you guys see my screen? Uh, yes, we can see, we can see it, Mike. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Yes, so uh, my name is Prince Dubé, and I participated in the uh, challenge for secure and trusted learning systems. Um, the project that we did was called a web class attention and authentication system. So uh, the people who did the project was myself, Prince Dubé, I'm on the right. I'm an electronic uh, engineering student at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. And then um, my colleague, Umbasa Kokile, he's also a, an electrical engineering student uh, at the University of Johannesburg. So uh, the name of our project was Web Class Attention and Authentication System. So uh, what we did is, uh, so we actually have a landing page where we're working on it. Um, so when we implement uh, new ideas and as we work on the project, we we sort of like update it and it's sort of like a an ongoing project that we still continuing to work on so um the idea behind the 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 project was now we are in the digital era and um a lot of people are now using are now learning through uh, online means they're using their devices like uh, laptops and using uh, iPads and tablets and as well as uh, cell phones. So um, so now what happens is we see that there is about 220 million people that have now started taking online classes. And the majority of these people are actually uh, the younger generation. And uh, the COVID pandemic just sort of like accelerated uh, this entire market. And uh, that's why the, the numbers has been, have been growing um, year on year. Uh, so, but then now what happens is when, when uh, people are now learning online, uh, it's sort of difficult to get, um, to get people to actually pay attention because some people can log on onto, um, onto a class and then they, you know, they busy doing something else or they even walk out of the room. And uh, so, what we came up with was um, 
a system whereby we try to look at how can we make sure that, well, first of all, the person who is logging onto uh, an online class is the actual person. And then uh, second of all is, uh, is this person paying attention? So, and it is important, especially the attention factor because currently um, educators are not able to get feedback as they would in a classroom in terms of, all right, uh, are people actually uh, paying attention to what we're saying? And um, so they, that it's now like a one-way, uh, it's a one-way exchange of information without any proper feedback and things can get lost in, in, in such settings. So uh, what we've done is um, we've tackled the, the two issues. The first one, uh, identification, is um, we, uh, we created a, a model, a facial recognition model, whereby um, we, we, trained, uh, we trained the model on like a lot of data uh, using um, like a, a VGGS data sets and also some of their uh, facial models. And we used uh, transfer learning so that um, we can basically um, pre-train the models and uh, they become lightweight and then they can be deployed onto, um, onto already existing platforms. So this is um, on our webpage currently, this is um, the image recognition where you, where you go onto the, onto the platform and then you authenticate yourself. So this is just a checking, this, it's a tool to visually check um, how the progress that we're currently making. But uh, in the final version, it will be running in the background. Um, and then it will also be running on top of a system, like for example, like a blackboard. And then in this in this model, um, currently we we are reaching uh, quite impressive levels of accuracy, uh, about 90, 99 percent accuracy. Um, but it it sort of like dips sometimes because uh, uh, what we've noticed is um, the training data that we've been using sometimes it can be skewed towards um, different uh, you know different skin tones or different complexions as well. So we still, that's what we still are trying to fine tune because once we train the model, for example, when we, uh, we have Asian faces or, or black faces that are, that are making up most of the, of the training data, uh, the, the, we find that the model actually, it gets very good at identifying those faces, but then the performance sort of tips when it comes to uh, identifying other faces. So we, are, we, we, we actually currently where we have different models for, for different faces and we still have to integrate them into one solution so that they can, they can um, accurately identify all the, the different types of uh, faces in terms of uh, across all racial lines and also uh, skin tones. And uh, in terms of the loss, so what we find is that um, as the as the model as we train it with more and more data, we generally see uh, the the loss of information uh, gradually decreasing, which means that uh, as we are training it, it's it's getting smarter and smarter all the time. Uh, and the second part of the of the identification as well, because uh, we're not just using the facial recognition, so it's voice recognition. So with the voice recognition, uh, we have it as an extra layer of security and also uh, for, for redundancy. Uh, currently, we are still in the design phases of the, of the voice recognition because it's a little bit um, more involved. And since this project is ongoing, uh, we, we still want to get the, you know, the, the, the facial recognition uh, part uh, working and then focus more on the on the voice recognition but uh anyway this is the, the the design where we we have an audio input and then we pre-process that uh, that data and and then we feed it into like a, a, a decoder that then is also linked to like a, an acoustic model uh, and then <clears throat> and then a, a language model so, um, and, and, and the complexity now comes in terms of the way that people, different people say uh, different words. So uh, our accents, for example, 
and we found that uh, that adds quite a, a, a lot of complexity and that's why we we have not um really uh, moved uh, as much uh, with it because we need more time to really dedicate um in terms of building all the the, the different acoustic models especially even uh, within a country like south africa we have uh, nine different languages and with all of those languages uh, you know people have their own uh, slight dif differing accents depending on where they're from so at an international level which is what we are hoping to you know to get this eventually um that that's going to be even uh, quite a, a little bit more complex but it's it's a it's a it's a work in progress and um and then for the attention part so here we wanted a ubiquitous uh, system that can be used whether someone is uh, whether someone is um, teaching uh, social sciences or they're teaching math and physics you know, or they're teaching languages so the idea here is um, to check for the attention and to simplify it we won't be checking for the content that's being presented but rather seeing all right um, are the students actually on their laptops or on their devices and are they uh, looking at the at the monitor and are they engaging with um, what's going on so um, the idea is that the the educator can just have like you know uh, prompts at different time at, at different times uh, during the, the lecture and then they can um, this can all be automated of course so that there isn't any actual um, the, the educator doesn't have to stop with what they're doing uh, and then a prompt can come and say um, uh, can you write this figure so here we're using a, a, a digit, for example. So it's we say, can you write uh, the, the figure five? And then you hold it up onto your screen for like a, a second or two. And then uh, we use image processing to convert that into, uh, into, uh, into a language that the, the, the computer can understand. And then we, we, see, we mesh it with what was prompted. So, the the screen prompt to say um write a five and then the the student will just write five and then they hold it up and then that that's a way of um making sure that the person is actually still engaged with what's going on on the screen and that's the the attention component of the of the system and um we are currently building the the system such that it's it's not a standalone system um it's a system that's designed to run on already existing uh, educational platforms uh platforms like for example the the black uh, the blackboard uh, framework where um when when students are when students are um, logging onto the system you know it it authenticates them and then uh, it's a way of them also just checking that all right um the student is actually engaging with what is happening um, on the screen at this time, because what is happening is uh, it should be a lecture. So if they are paying attention on what's happening on the screen, then that's good. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, resources, right, um, as much as it's an AI model, so the way that we, we structured it, and I mentioned it earlier that we're using transfer learning is that we have uh, pre-trained models that um, we train on a large corpus of data, and then um, the ones that they are actually going to be running on 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 top of the of the um, systems that are being used in different institutions, um, then are sort of like a lightweight version of of the of, of the system, and uh, we're doing this because one um, here in Africa. Um, data speeds are they can be a problem and also just uh, accessibility to to the internet yeah you know um some some people and institutions they still use uh, uh they buy like five gigabytes of data instead of just having like uh, a an unlimited wi-fi range so that's why we try to make it as light as possible so that it doesn't use on it doesn't use too much uh, on the resources of the students um, and the schools and then um, 
it also becomes uh, easily scalable because the, the lighter it is, the, the more uh, scalable it is. And um, it's a good system because it, it, there's a gap, right, between current proctored systems because in their current form, they are quite expensive. That's the first thing. And um, as expensive as they are, they also require a lot of resources and they're not something that can be done every every day for multiple um, multiple lectures, for example. So that's that's the advantage or the innovation of of, of the system. And uh, I am done. Uh, thank you. And um, the the project currently, if someone would like to sort of like uh, just see how far it is and whatnot, um, this is the the link to to the project. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. DB. We appreciate your presentation. That is very interesting. So let us keep tuned and uh, contribute to the effort we are on standard and uh, virtual graduate study consortium that we are building. Again, a congratulations to both of you about uh, your, uh, your award and uh, let your colleagues uh, know about and uh, let's uh, stay, stay tuned. Thank you for your, uh, your, uh, your participation of today's session. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, it's a uh, very, very interesting work as all, all the works we, we have seen today, um, combining technology uh, to improve uh, experiences in learning or to uh, secure systems, which is uh, our uh, goal in the uh, P2884 standard. So you're welcome also to join these groups and we are going to be contacting you more to uh, be involved in these developments. So we're gonna continue with our previous presentation that was uh, interrupted for a technical uh, problem. Now, Kushi Gupta, it's ready. Yes, sir. Okay, so let's uh, continue. You have any question for the previous presentation? Remember that you can um, use the chat uh, also to keep the conversation going on. And let's continue with this presentation. Uh, go ahead. I'm going to stop sharing mine and you can share yours. Yes. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, sorry about the issues earlier. So good morning, everyone. My name is Kushi Gupta, and I'm a doctoral student at Sam Houston State University pursuing my degree in digital forensics and cybersecurity. Um, my advisor is Dr. Jihan Varol, and today I will be presenting on the security and privacy of social media applications, a pedagogical approach. Um, so this is the certificate um, awarded to me. Thank you for that. Um, I will start my presentation. So um, most of you might be having some kind of social media applications. Um, they have become very ubiquitous in our lives. They have an influence on almost every aspect of, of our lives, be it communication with um, your friends, be it um, news or like any other form, like even gaming. Um, your social media applications have paved their way in almost every aspect of our lives. Um, they facilitate large scale communication, massive user engagement and information exchange. So um, one of the aspects, um, one of the many aspects that social media applications um, like social media applications have become near and dear to us is the learning platforms. So socioeconomic and education environments are highly dynamic. So um, from the past few years from the Blackboard, we have really transformed our ways of learning and teaching. So from the um, rooms with uh, chalk and Blackboard, we have come to more online ways of learning, be it learning management systems and um, 
recently we have shifted or paved our way through um, to social media in learning. So this necessitate, uh, necessitates innovation in teaching strategies to address the learning requirements of technically inclined students. Almost all the students today are more technically inclined than we were before, say a decade ago or two decades ago. So we need to change the teaching strategies that we have for those students in order to teach them appropriately so that they can understand better. So social media, as a result, has been increasingly being incorporated as a part of teaching pedagogies. And we, not, uh, we might not be unaware about this fact. Um, learning management systems are increasingly incorporating social media applications. Um, so this is what my presentation is based on. So the role of social media in education, we've spoken about the background of um, social media in education. Um, so what does it actually do? Um, how, how can students learn with social media? So social media facilitates the effective sharing of information among students. Um, so most of the news or most of the technological developments, all of them are um, so the social media plays an important role of effecting, uh, effective sharing of information, latest technological developments, et cetera. And it also bring, brings amongst active engagement with students. So they are highly engaged, um, thus they learn more, they learn better. Um, as shown by this picture right here um, that I have on my slide, you can see, um, 29% of teachers use social networking or social media for instructions. Um, and 15% of teachers value Facebook, Wiki and other social media sites for instruction. So um, now that we know that social media plays an important role in pedagogical approaches, how let's talk about how private and secure these applications are. Um, what kind of information can we garner from these applications? That's where my research comes into play. Um, my research is all about um, examining these social media applications and see what data artifacts are left behind. Um, so this was my, I laid my, I laid the foundation of my research um, with this research that I did. Um, this project that I did on Discord. So I forensically analyzed um, Discord, which is also a huge learning platform. So most, I, I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard about Discord and um, most of you even use Discord to communicate with your peers. Um, it's one of the major applications used in education right now. People make um, servers, groups, even um, cybersecurity servers are there. Um, people can communicate, there are several channels. Um, so what did I do for my research? Um, so I analyzed Discord um, from, um, from the Google Chrome web browser to see what personally identified identifiable information we can retrieve from it. Um, this research was published last year in Digital Investigation, one of Elsevier's journals. Um, and I'm gonna tell you more about what I did. So um, the importance and impact of this research. So Discord is a social media platform that allows users to communicate with voice and video calls, text messages, media and files, all by remaining completely anonymous. This is what they are very proud of. Um, um, they always say that um, Discord users are completely anonymous, but we will, are they really anonymous? We will find out from my research. So in 2021, Discord had about 30, 390 million registered users with 150 million active monthly users. That's, that's a lot. Um, so I conducted digital forensic analysis on Discord through the Google Chrome web browser. Um, and I looked at the cache and the log files stored. Um, and these are the, some of the results that I got. So I got a lot of results um, in terms of personal, personally identifiable information. And some of them are very shocking. For example, I also got um, the payment method used um, on the platform. I got chat messages all in plain text. 
um, digital media used in chats, server invites, and server event invites. And um, shown on the slides are two screenshots that I put, uh, put on my paper. The first screenshot um, tells you more about the the payment information, I actually used my own payment information, thus I had to blur it um, because I got everything. Um, like the um, the brand, the last four digits, expiry month and year, and my billing address. Um, so the second uh, screenshot shows you more about, more information about the ID, the user ID of a person, um, and the server ID. The username, as we can see here, username is Kim Carter, um, and all the all the other information. So um, we can even see content right here says this is for general communication, which was actually the chat message sent. So as you can see, you can see, as you can see in the screenshot, we can retrieve information such as your username, the time, the timestamps, the chat message was sent, the chat message itself, all in plain text which tells us that even though Discord is being used highly for education and students use it a lot for communication, um, it's not completely secure. We can still retrieve a lot of information. Um, future direction. Um, so I would like to build on my research by looking at different areas of the computer, um, such as the network traffic, the random access memory, and mobile application artifacts. Um, I am currently working on that. And in the future, I plan to do some intelligence on the artifacts I gathered so that um, investigators don't need to um, use a lot of time to piece together all the artifacts to generate actionable insights. Instead, I would like my system to do, to do that for them, saving a lot of time and giving better accuracy in investigations. Um, these are my references. Mm, thank you so much. Please shoot me any questions if you have. Thank you, Koshi. Uh, if, if there is any question for this presentation, please uh, go ahead. Um, thank you so much. This is a very good contribution. We have been following up your progress also since uh, last year. So this has been a very interesting uh, research in terms of how social networks and how internet tools uh, are used as educational platforms and how we can integrate them and make them more secure. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you. So we have one last presentation that is a, a video. It's a, a, from Alejandro Macho. Um, the title is IEEE Education Society 2022 Student Leadership Award. Uh, uh, it's one of the recipients of the, uh, is the recipient of the award for the Education Society 2022 Leadership Award. And we're going to um, go ahead with that video uh, right now. In one second. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Alejandro Macho, and I'm here today because I was honored, and of course, I was lucky to be awarded with the Student Leadership Award from the Education Society because of promoting uh, business and academic and personal and technical uh, projects across uh, companies, but also universities, high schools, etc. 
Uh, and I'm here today just because of this. I want to share with you my findings about this. Uh, I want to encourage you to participate in all the projects, activities, companies, wherever you find in your university, city, whatever, as you can. Why? Because you are going to learn so incredible things that you are, that, and those things are going to be very useful to you in your professional career. Uh, this is important because, and, and I want to share with you, um, well, uh, the living example of uh, my, my life when I was a student at the university studying my engineering degree. I was able to create an association because of, well, because we wanted to do things. And that, is, uh, that was our model. And, and that is important because we, we knew we wanted to do things. We didn't know which things we, we wanted to do. Uh, the process of knowing that was very, very useful. But also we had the opportunity to work with different companies like Microsoft or institution like the Fulbright Commission or the US Embassy, uh, working with different universities across the whole country. Uh, that was very, very interesting. And it was very useful because I and the, the rest of the people who participated, uh, we, we learned a lot. So I wanted to encourage you to do that. And also, um, uh, when you finish your, your degree or your studies, uh, don't hesitate to stay in touch with the university. I finished my engineering degree eight years ago, more or less. And the very first moment I started to work in a company like Deloitte as a consultant. But I continue linked with the university. I studied my master's and now I just finished my PhD. And that is important because you can always find a way to connect the business part with the academic part. You can take learning from one field to another. And that is very, very interesting because it is going to make you a very special profile for both academic institutions and companies. Uh, and today I wanted to say that I'm here to help you in all I can. So don't hesitate to contact me if, if you think I can help you somehow. I would be more than happy to do so. Currently, my experience uh, is not only in consultancy in Deloitte. I moved to Fever, a company that now is in a lot of countries and we deliver uh, leisure experiences. Um, you may know the Money Heist uh, TV series. We have created experiences for uh, also for Harry Potter and so on. And I've been working in that area as the, uh, in operations. So I have different uh, knowledge about payments, about logistics, about how to well, go to another country to open the company and so on. But my main role right now is being head of cybersecurity in a part of Iberdrola, um, one of the major energy companies in the world, especially in renewables. So I just wanted to say that, uh, do as much as you can get the best result, the best academic results you can, that is not all. So I encourage you to do other things, to create projects, to participate in projects, to be a volunteer, in different aspects. Uh, I've been doing it for years. I've been volunteer, I've been studying, I've been working in different projects. And you learn a lot. You, your profile is going to be more and more valuable because of those things. So that is all I wanted to say. So thank you for your attention. If you want to contact me, I'm sure you have my contact details on the event information. So thank you again and have a good day here in this great event. So thank you very much. So we have now the last presenter. 
that is uh, uh, inviting you to continue to contribute uh, to uh, to participate within your universities and also in the society uh, to contribute to uh, IEEE activities. Uh, we are we at, at IEEE Education Society are enablers, so we enablers of networking and uh, we are creating many initiatives that will help you to to be with us so if you need for example advices about how to create a student branch we are here to let you know how to create a student branch uh, an education society student branch in your university we will help you guide you how to make it well what we should know is that one person cannot cannot reach uh, all the goals we have to be together not only one person but we have to be together in order to achieve some goals only one person in a university trying to 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 benefit from our initiative is not val valuable so uh, we 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 are we are proud to have you students on board with us. Uh, your contribution are valuable for us and humanity. Think about humanity, what you can bring, the small, small drop that you can bring that will help uh, humanity. Uh, as you know, the slogan of IEEE Education Society is technologies for humanities. And what we saw today is that each one of of the the presenters brought something that will help humanity and also help networking and and get some hints about uh, which others are doing so thank you very much for your contribution and we encourage you to to bring your own initiative i ask one question in the in the group what is a a uh, this, 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 the website of IEEE Education Society. So I, I have this uh, uh, answer. You can click there and you will find on the first page that we have new initiatives, call for initiative. So if you have some ideas about getting seed money to, to, to for showcases to do something, that is, you can, you can, you can propose your initiative and maybe that will be helpful and if we we are aware of, of it if this it, it didn't uh, uh, pass through this initiative this one this call will we have some other ways of uh, getting you some hints to uh, to move forward you we have also uh, our new president a uh, 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 present a new initiative of the best PhD student award. This is new in our society. So uh, uh, the best is no, that it means only one. So try to do your best to get like, uh, to, to be awarded or to participate. Just participating is something interesting. We'll know all that you are there and get you uh, in touch with uh, our colleagues. Uh, IEEE education activities also will propose uh, through IEEE educational activities uh, an initiative on open hardware, open hardware for education. So we will have industries with us that will maybe pro provide us uh, hardware and uh, we will uh, uh, also try from, from scratch, from a simple a, a, a integrated circuits or simple circuits to build some uh, something for education. So stay tuned. We, uh, we need you as proactive participants. We also, uh, a, a, through IEEE educational activities, uh, going to make a call for distinguished lecturer program. I don't know, do you know about what is Distinguished Lecturer Program? 
someone knows. I, I want to hear someone. Okay, each society, they have distinguished lecturer program. For example, you are organizing an activity, you can request IEEE to help you get a, a, an invited lecturer a, that will bring on, on an, a specific topic. So we can help to get some, so we can get some help to enable the activity where you are. But uh, remember, it's not only for a single person, it's for a, a group. So don't think about only yourself. This is very, that is the advice I can, and I, I am still giving to many of, of you. Don't never think about only yourself. If you think only about yourself, uh, you are not going to go far, but thinking in, in, in team and thinking on, on what, who is need something uh, that is, uh, who is in need will help you to, to, uh, to, uh, to achieve your, your goals. So uh, for the distinguished lecturer program, in my, my, uh, my mandate, what I committed to do is to get also student lecturer in the, in the list. So stay tuned in the call, we need some of, of you also to be a distinguished lecturer program, a, a lecturer. So maybe moving to, a, to, to some countries, we can enable these. And also at Alteplay Education Society, we have joint activities like the standard on secure and trusted learning system. It is a standard with Alteplay Education Society, Alteplay Industrial Electronic Society, and Alteplay Computer Society. So we are moving to get inter societies uh, activities. We have also a, a uh, uh, we have also a tie with IEEE Education Activity Board. So maybe it doesn't mean something for many of you about the structure of IEEE Education Society, but we will also uh, uh, get one another other activities to, uh, to bring people to explain the big pattern of IEEE uh, and the new future directions of IEEE. One of the direction that is uh, uh, that is uh, now ongoing is on climate change. So technologies for climate change. And those who are in charge through IEEE with this, uh, this initiative are thinking about ac actions, not only talking. So everything you brought, everything you presented today is needed in the in the in the framework of education of uh, uh, climate change, and uh, so IEEE committed to to bring things in climate change. So this is also uh, under IEEE Education Society is participating, and we have also IEEE Industrial Elect uh, Industrial so uh, Society, not Electronics uh, Application Society, Industrial Application Society. So thank you, and uh, we have also uh, through the years, through years, uh, some seed money on of from IEEE Technical Activity Board. They used to give us some uh, to to make some calls for initiative. We got this this call uh, uh, started to to start IEEE a uh, standard for on secure and trusted learning system. It uh, when we started we got a seed money to start it. So I need, uh, so we are also, uh, I think from these presentations and your participation, one thing that we can, we can try to get, I say, I saw Jose Baca replied about TLT is transaction on learning technology. It is a journal of IEEE Education Society that uh, has a, that has a higher hand of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, quotation uh, uh, so co scopus and other so maybe if you need uh, if from what you are bringing uh, from your questions today and later on maybe we can we can 
a request for a special issue of, of the publication of your work. So you are free to, to, to find also through our virtual graduate study consortium initiative uh, uh, to, to ask us because we said we are co-constructing it. So we need you to bring your, your, uh, your ideas in order uh, for this initiative to be yours. So I'll, I'll not be long. We are here since this morning, but we are very happy to contribute. And I am happy also to get Luis Felipe, a, a professor at a, 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 tell me. Embry, Embry Riddle. Em, yes. Embry Riddle, Embry Riddle, and a former student at Florida Atlantic University. His thesis was on online laboratories and he contributed great a lot on the standard on, 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 on online laboratories, the first standard of RTP Education Society. So I'm happy, we are happy to get him like the chair of uh, RTP Standard Committee. And uh, uh, during education week, we also had a IEEE on magnetics. Uh, we joined joint effort uh, with Education Society to present why standards are important for learning and how we can make like we can study and and uh, and uh, and uh, participate to standard and we also we show this uh, process through our development of, of standard we were we got many students participating and now they are professors and uh, 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 administrators and researchers and uh, many uh, through the the process of standardization so this is a, a, a new trend, but it is an old, it was a, an old trend because me, I remember my master degree was about uh, uh, based on a standard because my professor was fellow at IEEE, uh, IEEE and also the standard he participated to develop was what I applied for my master degree in the 80s. So thank you very much. And uh, I need not to get the last word. I need some words from you to, uh, for a few minutes. You have the floor. Everyone would like to talk. So you're open. Uh, the microphones can be open. You can open your microphone. Uh, we are closing the, the event. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hamadou, also for uh, putting together all of this strategy for the uh, IEEE uh, week. Uh, thank you also to the participants that were committed to send the works uh, being here today connected. As uh, one of the students and pupils of Dr. Hamadou over the years, I've been blessed of the uh, guidance and mentorship from Dr. Hamadou Salia Hassan as a student from 2015 uh, at Florida Atlantic University. He was part of my um, dissertation uh, evaluators committee. And uh, I also, as he mentioned, joined the standardization process around that time and had the chance to learn, contribute and collaborate uh, in this strategy. So if somebody has any final comment or remark, you're welcome. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, I would like to just give out a few thoughts. Um, so it was really nice me presenting what we had. Uh, initially, we, we, we started developing this project a few months ago last year in the, in the month of November. And uh, we are really glad that we could show some progress uh, as of now. And even looking at the other projects in the other standards as well, not only the standard that we are contributing to it. So um, this session, this few hours was really uh, great for knowledge transition, sh sharing what we have all uh, found out, uh, new ideas. Um, really interested and excited uh, to see what we can do in the future as well. And thank you for organizing this session and having this time for us to share each other's knowledge. Thank you very much. We are expecting you to continue 
and also through uh, a social media we are expecting also to to meet you we are we are doing we would like to meet you as well in the future thank you very much yeah thank you doc dr hamdu thank you dr louis and for this uh, great 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 session uh, on organizing this and uh, giving us the opportunity to talk to you and do this presentation uh, it was really nice and uh, thank you for um, organizing all these uh, competitions and um, uh, really the uh, these sessions so yeah i want to simply say thank you to everyone Thank you so much for everything. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm closing this the uh, this meeting and uh, let's make everything uh, sustainable. So it's not as I said, a, a just one one session today, but it is continuous. So anytime, get uh, we will try will enable networking to all the active uh, participants and also with our uh, uh, colleagues so stay tuned and ask us questions and we we have answer thank you and feel, feel you. free to add uh, our profiles to your contacts i already received some requests through research gate linkedin so if you can also share those contacts with us we will be uh, glad to add you to to our network of contacts thank you so much bye bye dr hamadou thank you for okay, your time thank you bye